Well, good morning and welcome to this time of worship here at First United Methodist Church of Rosenberg. My name is Jeremy. I'm the pastor here, and I'm grateful for your choice to be with us as we seek to worship our God in spirit and in truth. Just a couple of quick reminders before we get any farther. Uh, The first is that we'll have our uh, Fort Bend Hope, um, our after school program joining us once again this Wednesday at 4 p.m. We're going to be planting out in the community garden. We're planting our uh, spring crop this week. Uh, So this Wednesday, if you want to come help out with that or any Wednesday after that, or maybe even uh, coming out to weed the beds or water the flowers or anything or the plants in between, uh, we'd love to have your help if you're interested in that. Our fiesta at first this year, it's a a live and silent auction and meal and fundraiser. Uh, It's going to be April the 29th. Those tickets are going to go on sale soon, so be on the lookout for uh, more details about that. Uh, coming up very quickly. I also want to make sure you know we'll have a Maundy Thursday service of worship this year. Uh, That's the Thursday before Easter. We'll do a 7 p.m. service. Uh, We'll post something online and do our in-person service as well that evening. Uh, So Maundy Thursday, 7 p.m. Our Easter Sunday service time uh, will be the same as it always is, uh, 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. Uh, We'll go a little bigger and have just a beautiful, wonderful time to celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Uh, But we're not going to do a a sunrise service or anything else like that. So just for your planning purposes, uh, our time will still be the same as it always is. We'll do our flowering of the cross and some of those other kind of traditional things. Uh, but just our one worship service as usual at 10 a.m. on Easter Sunday. The last thing I want to mention is that we had our March board meeting this past week. Uh, We continue to press forward with various conversations and decisions regarding our church's uh, present and and a future direction. Uh, We're continuing with our office move. We're moving from the uh, current house on the corner uh, over to what's been used as our nursery house right now. So that process is continuing. Uh, We'll be sure to put out a wish list for you very soon. Uh, Some items we'd love to update in the process uh, of making that move. Um, We've also got some bigger picture conversations going on at the board level, uh, really trying to help finalize and kind of discern our pathway forward. Uh, The Ezra team did a bunch of work last year, uh, working to claim a a vision, a big kind of grand vision for what this church might look like as something of a a missional hub for a community. Uh, We're trying to roll that conversation out a little broader uh, to consider if that is the right vision for this uh, church's future uh, or maybe something else. Uh, We're going to do a a town hall April the 24th. That's the Sunday after Easter. Uh, We'll kind of take our worship time or our sermon time uh, to do a town hall and have us kind of a similar thing that we'll post for our online service that day. Uh, We'll put out a survey. There's a a variety of different ways that uh, we might move forward. We're really trying to get down to that concrete and practical level over the next few months uh, to really start moving in in a specific direction, making sure that we do all we can to continue to see God do incredible and amazing things that begin here in our church community. Uh, There's a more full board update there in the the notes to the service. Uh, You can click that link to read the whole thing. It'll explain a little bit more what I'm talking about, some of those options and potential ways that we might move forward. Uh, Again, we'll do a a survey, we'll have discussion groups, we'll have uh, that town hall Sunday, but at any time, I would really love to know your heart and your passion for the future of this church. How do you see God best using uh, what we've begun here in a way that lasts for 5, 10, 50 years down the road? And what does that really faithful vision look like so we can really start beginning to make some decisions uh, and move in that direction that God is calling us to in this season ahead? Now, friends, we continue our journey through the Lenten season, focusing upon the ways that God invites us to turn and to face him. Repentance is that kind of core word for the day, that idea of both turning away from sin, but also remembering we turn toward Jesus Christ. We turn toward that vision and toward toward that love and action of God in our lives so that we can follow wholeheartedly toward that resurrection day when we know nothing but the fullness and the healing that God alone makes possible. So friends, in that hope and in that spirit, let us focus our eyes and our hearts upon the Lord for worship this day.
Well, friends, we come to the time in our service and we're invited to share with God all that is on our hearts and minds in prayer. I would first lift up the family and friends of Mary Lou Bailey. Uh, Many of you will remember Mary Lou passed away a few weeks ago. Uh, The family held a service in her hometown where she was buried. We're also going to have a memorial service for her on Saturday, April the 2nd. That'll be 11 a.m. Saturday, April the 2nd. Uh, We'd love to honor and to celebrate Mary Lou's life. So if you're able, we'd love to have you here uh, on Saturday the 2nd. Uh, Above all else, please keep her family in your prayers as they prepare for this uh, final memorial service to celebrate her life once more. Now, friends, we give thanks that we're invited to share all that we have and all that we are at the foot of the cross, to lay it all there, knowing that God receives our prayers and through it all will make us new. So in that hope and in that spirit, let us turn our minds and our hearts to God in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, fill us with your grace, fill us with your glory. Strengthen us to trust in you more and more each day, to catch your bold vision for our lives and for our community so that your love would never end with us, but would instead plant the seeds that go on to transform the world. God, in our times of trial and struggle, comfort us. Help us to know you're with us. Remind us that you are the good shepherd and that you'll be by our side no matter what. In our times of joy and celebration, remind us of all those good and perfect gifts you poured out. Help us to feel the urgency of your kingdom coming into this world that we might follow boldly where you're leading us in those moments. God, in all things, bind our hearts together as one so that whether we're in the same room or across time and space, we would know that we don't take this journey alone. You are with us. And our brothers and sisters want to bear our burdens so that we can continue to grow closer to one another as we grow closer to you. So God, receive the joys and concerns of our hearts, all those prayers spoken and unspoken and those that only you know. Wrap them all in your arms of grace, and God, through everything, draw us closer to you. It's in your Son's name that we pray as we join in the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our primary scripture reading for the day comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Hear now the word of the Lord. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And he replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, hide me behind your cross so that it might be your word that is spoken this day, so that it might be your Holy Spirit that touches our lives and makes us new. Amen. You know, I've heard it said that Jesus came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. You're not going to find that as a direct quote in Scripture anywhere. But it's passages like that of the fig tree that we just read that make it possible to make such a statement. I have to imagine if you were to poll a hundred people who know at least something about Jesus, if you were to ask them the most notable virtues, the most notable characteristics of Jesus, I suspect one of the most consistent answers you would hear would reference Jesus' compassion, his forgiveness, his willingness to work and to heal those people who need God's presence in their lives. 
You'd probably hear about his power to feed hungry people, about his willingness to humble himself to heal and to eat with those on the outskirts of society, to challenge the rules of the leaders around him in order to reach down to the least, the last, and the lost. You might hear about how time and again Jesus has patience and he's willing to give second chances. You probably hear a lot about the level of comfort Jesus brings to those who are afflicted with various diseases, with discomfort, with the disgust of proper society, with all those who are afflicted with various ailments in his day. You'd hear a lot about how much Jesus wants to comfort them. If you talk to someone of the right tradition or the right background, you might also get a very different answer, of course. Some people love to point to the relentless ways that Jesus challenges the leaders in his time. Whether it was the defiant way that he challenged the kingship of Rome on Palm Sunday, or whether it was the harsh words that he spoke to the Jewish people in the temple, there were all sorts of ways he had a, this way of pushing past what was normal, these ways of pushing past what was happening in his time toward what needed to become. And this is the same guy who overturned the money changers' tables in the temple. This is the same guy who had the gall to tell the Jewish leaders to stop showing off with their long robes and their public prayers. Toward those who were comfortable in their positions of power. Toward those who were comfortable with the way things had always been done. Toward the comfortable, Jesus didn't act with that same level of care and compassion. Jesus afflicted them time and time again with a call to become something more. Jesus came to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. The problem with trying to make any kind of clear and simple statement about the most fundamental, the most significant, the most important characteristic of Jesus, the problem with trying to boil him down to one single talking point is that it becomes all too easy to settle our gaze on one extreme to the exclusion of the other. The reality is that we all fall short at times. And at times, we all show the world a glimpse of that love and compassion that God makes possible. At times, we are all in need of comfort. And at times, we're all in need of the affliction of Jesus. No one is entirely guilty, and no one is entirely commendable at all times. What matters more than trying to determine who the good and the bad people are, what matters more than that is trying to ensure that the fruit our lives produce the fruit of our actions and words and deeds, of assuring that that fruit points others toward God and the life God makes possible more than it points them anywhere else. Jesus, in our reading from today, speaks of the fruit of our lives by telling a parable about a fig tree. The owner of the fig tree came to look at that fruit that it had borne, but finding no fruit, he became upset and told the gardener to go ahead and pull it out of the ground. For three years, that tree had been a waste of soil, he told the gardener. Take it out now. But the gardener responded and said to give it one more year. Put manure around the base and dig around it to give it its best chance of survival. And if next year it still hasn't borne any fruit, then you can cut it down. And this is one of those moments where I'd really like to go up to Jesus and maybe shake him just a little bit and say, come on, why don't you just tell us what you really mean? Why do you got to use these confusing parables? It seems like there are so many other ways that he could have made this point more clearly. What are you saying to us, Jesus? Should the tree be cut down or not? It's a strange and it's a frustrating parable. But I also think the beauty of using a parable here is that it does force us to sit with this tension between two equally important, uh, important possibilities. On the one hand, there is no point of wasting soil if this tree will never bear fruit. The owner is right to want to cut down a fruitless tree. But then on the other hand, the gardener knows that hope is not lost yet. Perhaps just one more year with the right kind of care is going to make this tree as fruitful as any other one that the owner could ever plant. It's only time that will tell if the owner or the gardener had the right idea to start with. And of course, we don't get to know whose answer was right in this parable. And now if the story was really just about actual plants and actual fig trees, then of course, we'd have very little to worry about. There are a few gardeners among us, of course. That kind of message might affect our community garden plans, but not much else about our lives. But no, 
As with all the parables of Jesus, the story is about a whole lot more than just some fig tree. In this story, Jesus is challenging us to consider the fruit that our lives bear, especially to consider the fruit that is borne by our life together as a church community, not just as individual children of God, but by our life in the church, by the fruit that we bear as the body of Christ in this world. But of course, just like the owner and just like the gardener, we don't actually know exactly what fruit our lives are going to bear one year from now. Wasted soil does no good, but there's always reason to hope that God is still at work. And to make this point, Jesus is challenging the Jewish leaders in his days, telling them this parable, telling them to consider the fruit that their lives are bearing. The Jewish people, God's people on this earth, had been named and claimed by God many, many years before. It happened since the calling of Abraham that they were blessed to be a blessing to the whole world. And that identity as God's people meant that they bore a special responsibility to live their lives in a way that it would bear the fruit of God's love and God's grace, that would bear the fruit of what God was doing in their lives and go on to bless the whole world. By the time Jesus came onto the scene, there were a variety of reasons, there were a variety of ways that these very people were failing to live up to that great ideal. Jesus was a Jewish leader. He was one who came and constantly challenged his fellow Jewish people to further embrace and to fully reflect the call that God placed on them so many years ago. And for most of the life and ministry of Jesus, that challenge to embrace God's call, to embrace what God was doing in God's people's lives, for most of Jesus' time, that calling was less than successful. For about three years, Jesus was on this earth teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God, and he was wandering through the Judean countryside. He was trying to lead God's people to live lives that bore greater fruit. And for all those three years, almost all that he got was pushback. He got fighting. He found people falling short. Some did better, and others, of course, did worse. But like the owner saw in the parable, at the end of three years, there was very little evidence that the kind of lasting fruit Jesus sought would ever come. The people might as well have been a waste of soil with how little progress he saw. But also like the gardener pointed out to the owner, not all hope was lost just yet. It was worth giving one more chance to the tree. It was worth giving one more chance to God's people. God was not through with them yet. And here again, we find one of the tensions at the heart of the gospel message. We find that Jesus Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. We find that even though we are undeserving, God chose to act one more time. God chose to act once again to give us a chance to bear the fruits of God's love and God's grace. And that God chose to act for unworthy sinners means that God is never anywhere near done with us yet. There is more time. There is more to be done. There is a second chance. There is a reason to hope for a new tomorrow each time that tomorrow comes. But also, no matter what happens today, tomorrow will come. And just because there is time doesn't mean that we don't have to change. We can feel the urgency of God's kingdom. We can desire for God to come build God's kingdom here and now. And... At the same time we feel that urgency, we can also have the patience and the comfort that God will do what God's going to do in God's time and not in our own. I think far too often we're faced with that sort of tension, that tension between seeking transformation and accepting God's forgiveness. Are we in need of change or are we good enough? And in those moments, we often look to the wrong kinds of fruit as the evidence that we're already good enough. We try to find ways to build a wall with our accomplishments, with all of our deeds of Christian charity and all of our contributions to the greater good. I'm a pastor, I might say. I might be the one to say that I surely I've borne enough fruit to be safe where I am, to be good enough where I am. Or I might say that I tithe on my five-figure, six-figure salary, whatever it might be. I might try to say that that money does good enough, and therefore I'm covered from any other commitments or obligations. Or I might say that I give away plenty of food, I give, uh, go on plenty of mission projects, I always treat people with respect. Surely God couldn't ask any more of me. We have this way sometimes of 
It's like we think if we can put up this wall and show that we're good enough, that we've done enough, that we can list off our accomplishments enough, if we can just do that, then maybe we won't have to feel that transforming hand of God. Maybe we won't have to feel God go too deep into our lives and change too much. Maybe we can avoid the refiner's fire because if we disprove that we've done enough, then we're already close enough. I think so many of us have this all too natural urge to want to find and define good enough so that we can say that what I've done is what I was asked to do and I've done it well enough. It's that urge inside of me that is a perfectionist that has felt this way from birth. I feel that need all the time, that need to get it right, that need to, kn that need to know that I've done just what was asked of me, that need to know exactly what I've done wrong so I can correct it and prevent that same mistake from happening ever again. That desire to continue to know what I can do better so I can do good enough. And I think that if I just list enough accomplishments, then I'll be okay. But of course our calling and our challenge as Christians is not to be or to become good enough. Our challenge and our calling is never to be or to become good enough. By the grace of God, before we're anything else, we are loved, we are accepted, we are enough. Each and every one of us, each and every part of us. That is the assumption of every child of God in this world. That is the sure foundation on which we all stand. Our calling and our challenge is to sit with the tension. Our calling and our challenge is to hear and to embrace both kinds of moments. In those moments when I feel comfortable, I need to be afflicted to recognize that there is always more with God. In moments when I feel affliction and doubt, I need to feel the comfort of knowing that the victory is already won. It's not up to me. It was never up to me. It was never supposed to be. Through Christ, we have all the time in the world we can relax. And also Christ makes all the difference in the world, so we got to get ready for a new and better tomorrow for what Christ is going to do next. The church is this place in the world where we can stand in that tension side by side. The church doesn't exist to serve its members. It exists to fulfill the mission of God. To fulfill that mission is to claim our identity as a Christian. To claim our identity as a Christian is to claim that responsibility to share God's love and God's grace with the people we meet. It is to embody and to embrace the call that God made upon God's people all that time ago with Abraham. But of course, the battle is not in our hands. The battle is in the hands that were outstretched on the cross, so we would never have to wonder if God's love is strong enough to heal even this broken sinner. The battle isn't in our hands. It's in the hands of love and grace of Jesus Christ. Look at the fruit of our actions. Does that fruit show that we're empowered by God? Or does it show that we're doing things on our own out of fear or out of pride? The best evidence that we're on the right track is to find that right balance of comfort and affliction in our lives. God empowers us to live for so much more to be so much better than we could become on our own. But that doesn't mean that we should run ourselves ragged trying to be all things to all people. It doesn't mean that the kingdom of God rises or falls with our ability to be faithful enough or good enough. It does mean that if we put up a wall of fear, a wall of fear for what God will find out, or a wall of fear for the pride in what we've done, if we put up those walls of our accomplishments, whether out of fear or out of pride, then we miss the point of bearing fruit. Because we were never supposed to be the ones in control of the story. The victory was never ours to attain. Bearing fruit means giving witness to the one who comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comforted. It means helping the world see that the kingdom of God, that the new life Christ makes possible, to see that it is worthy of our time and our efforts. It means getting beyond our comfort zone and seeking out healing for those afflictions that our world faces. God empowers us to move and enables us to see our destination. So ask yourself if others can see it in us too. Do our lives and does this com church community, does it show the rest of the world that something more and better is possible? 
Or are we just wasting soil and wondering if one day we're going to be cut down? We're in a challenging and difficult moment of discernment as a church community. We've done lots of work. We've had lots of conversations in the last year and a half to start asking those difficult questions, to start defining what it is we want to see come next. Our leadership board has begun the work of making real and practical decisions, of starting to move in a clear and concrete direction. Over the next few months, we're going to work to define what that truly looks like for our community. What does it look like for us to bear fruit five or even 10 years, even 50 years down the road? The Ezra team did a big part of this work last year. They worked to generate a grand vision for what might come next for our church. There are at least two other options, probably many more, that seem clearly possible. I've shared some of those in our March board update. You can click the link to the worship service and again, see that update and those options that we've put out there. As our board continues to work to finally claim a clear direction for our church, we're going to get much more practical. We want to continue to invite conversation in these next few months. On April 24th, that's the Sunday after Easter, we're going to have a town hall in worship. We'll have an opportunity to talk more, to ask more questions. We'll solicit your feedback through a survey shortly after that. I know that I or any board member would welcome your feedback, would welcome your thoughts at any point along the way. We'd love to know where your heart is what your desire is, what you see God doing in this neighborhood, in this church, through this community, wherever, whatever, whenever that might be. What does it look like for us to bear that kind of fruit that God alone can produce? Throughout all of Lent, we prepare our hearts and our minds for the fullness of all that God accomplished on that first Easter morning. Today, in this moment, we focus on the urgent fruit that's born out of a faithful life. So it's only appropriate that we also work together. We work together to define the fruit that we hope to bear as a community in Christ. We can take comfort in the fact that God is faithful. God will work in us. God will bless us. God will use us to make God's love a reality no matter what comes next, no matter what choices we make. And... And we also need to feel the urgency that comes when God is doing a new thing, a new thing to transform our lives and our community. As a church and as children of God, we're invited to let God tear down those walls of our hearts, tear down the walls of fear that might keep us stuck, tear down the walls of pride that might keep us from seeing or trusting in what God will do next. Because there is always more time for change to take place in our life. There's always more time until there isn't. We're invited to bear the fruits that are worthy of repentance. Bear the fruits that are worthy of the kingdom of God coming into this world here and now. We're invited to bear fruits that witness to the abundant life that God is and makes possible. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, friends, this concludes another time of worship together. Don't forget to mark your calendars for April the 29th for our Fiesta at First. Those tickets will be on sale soon. Uh, come out any Wednesday in the spring to help out with the garden or with the Fort Bend Hope after school program. And of course, take a look at that update from the leadership board. We'd love to have your feedback as we continue to make decisions and figure out where God is calling us to go 5, 10, even 50 years into the future. And now, friends, go forth in the grace and the love of our God, giving thanks that God is with us, giving thanks that God's love is the sure foundation on which we stand, and in all things, seeking to catch that vision of the beautiful life God has in store for us next. Go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to love and serve our Lord. Amen.